Yo. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast where a behavioral scientist examines what it's like to live a humorous life. Glimpse into the lives of the funniest people in entertainment, business, and science as your host, Dr. Peter McGraw, explores their habits, motivations, and secrets to success. Get ready to fire up your brain and your funny bone. Now, here's your host. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast that looks at the lives of funny people. I'm Peter McGraw. Today's guest is Jamie Gong. Jamie is the founder and producer of Takeout Comedy, located here in Hong Kong. It's the first full-time comedy club in Asia. He's been on Late Night with Conan O'Brien. He's been knighted by the country of Malta, and he carried the Olympic torch through Lower Manhattan for the 2004 Summer Olympics. Welcome, Jamie. Welcome. It's good to have you here in Hong Kong. Yeah, it's great. So, first question for you. If you weren't working as a comedian or as a comedy club manager, what would you be doing? I will probably kill myself. <laughs> uh, I believe in destiny. This was what I was meant to be, having hit the stage for the first time in 1989. Okay. And just growing up watching The Tonight Show, I, I believe in this was my calling. So uh, if I wasn't be doing this, I, I've told people I'll, I'll probably be dead. Greatest um, job in the world, just making people laugh. So I know you, you have a joke about being an engineer. Your, your parents wanted you to be an engineer. Well, this is 30 years ago you researched my <laughs> <laughs> This is when I was, I, I entered a comedy competition at Syracuse University. So I was an engineering belief. I was at, back then, uh, as an immigrant family, Chinese, you know, you know, my parents wanted us to be either doctors, lawyers, uh-huh. accountants, engineers. So I was a civil engineering major at Syracuse University. And I was on probation in my freshman year, and I actually eventually became a geography major. And then that was my first dab at Stamp Comedy in my sophomore year, 1989. Okay. I, I had a, just an engineering joke about how ridiculous these problems were. They were asked the velocity of a cue ball hitting uh, uh, at an angle of 8 degrees in a pool hall. And the question comes out, what is Billy's uh, social security number? Uh, so <laughs> it, it was just... <laughs> so, so you and I have somewhat parallel lives. I think we're about the same age. I was a sophomore. 32. Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, very close. <laughs> and I actually started out as a me- mechanical engineer, made it one semester, and then switched into psychology. And I was at Rutgers University. Oh, nearby, yeah. Uh, yeah, so four hours away. I actually, as a freshman, drove up. Go Big um, East. Yeah, to, to, <laughs> to watch uh, Syracuse and, and Rutgers play, play football. So we might have been at that same yeah. game. So one difference between the two of us, besides you turning out funny and, um, and me not, was you, you're one of six children. So Num- number I, three out of six. Yeah, I'm, I'm number one of two. So, so what, was that, what was that like? And do you think that, did that have any effect on, your, on this calling, do you think? Well, I'll tell you. I'm a dad myself with one child, and he's six. And right. now I have so much appreciation for my parents, especially for my mother. My parents were, are divorced. Okay. Uh, and my dad really was there for us growing up. Now looking back, in hindsight, my mom did everything for us. And uh, was with the six of us, all her concerns were just making sure we ate and survived. So yeah. <laughs> and, uh, she had six kids in 10 years uh, when she was 30 to 40. So my older sister is 10 months only older than me. So regarding material, I mean, we definitely play. It's great just to have siblings over there. I remember my youngest sister, we uh, had hoped it would be a boy so that we could uh, emulate the Brady Bunch. Okay. That was growing up <laughs> watching it. But I think uh, just having fun growing up with those kids helped me laugh and help me have a good childhood and, and look at the lighter side of things. Uh-huh. I mean, I guess indirectly it helped me become who I am today. And are you, uh, are you a little bit of an outsider in your family? Like, so I'm assuming these, your, your siblings turned out to be, do they turn out to be lawyers and doctors and engineers as, my oldest, as by plan? My oldest brother went to Cornell for uh, bio, biology, and then uh-huh. he ended up getting a PhD at UCLA, so now he works for uh, Accenture. Then my older sister actually became a doctor. Okay. Now she's an OBGYN doctor in New York City. And I'm okay. a comedian. Then my three other y- younger sisters are all, uh, one's a teacher, one's in a, in a, in a tech um, uh, business, and one's a housewife. So, but we all were, as an Asian family, a Chinese family in Chinatown, you know, study hard, study hard. I was, I'm proud to actually say that we were, all six of us went to the prestigious Stuyvesant High School. Okay. I don't know you oh, heard yeah. about that in New York City. Uh-huh. So, and then 
now two of my nephews uh, nieces have have gone there so now i can safely say uh we, we looked it up and pretty and pretty much nobody in the history has ever had that many family members in this prestigious high school okay so what was your question again about john Gramley? <laughs> <laughs> no i was just i was curious like i think it's interesting for for people who from outside of comedy is how do you, you know how does someone get into comedy i know you I know your friends are urged you to to enter a comedy contest, a stand up contest, right? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one thing. You know, like I said, now looking back, my mom didn't. We have uh, my son Emmett. We make sure he goes to bed at eight. Okay. Right. My mom didn't really have strict timelines for us to go to sleep, so I actually like to sleep late. So I was watching the Tonight Show, Johnny okay. Carson, like eleven thirty, eleven thirty five. Late, going to sleep at twelve thirty. So if she was really uh, pushing us to sleep early. I would have missed watching the, the late show. Uh-huh. And that's how I actually fell in love with Stan Comedy. I realized what Johnny Carson was doing. Okay. So, I, again, this all indirectly fate or destiny helped me become who I am today. Uh, just I remember just watching The Tonight Show. That really helped me uh, uh, realize the power of laughter. You know, I think it's interesting how much comedy has changed. Like, the distribution of comedy has changed, right? So, The, the, the Tonight Show would launch careers yes right he carson was a tastemaker and would invite people back and and it would then they they would have opportunities people paid attention right television paid attention to to what was happening there so you you run a comedy club we're we're downstairs in so this is the soho neighborhood in in hong kong how did that happen? What is that like? Tell me, like, tell me what your day. What was today? You have a you have a show in a couple hours. A show in a couple hours. What, what was your day like? What was going on? Today? Well, we had hoped to have sh- shows every night when I built this. We just celebrated our eleventh anniversary last okay. week, so we were excited. Uh, over seventeen hundred shows. We basically built the first full time comedy club in Asia before we even had comedians. Okay. So I came here just to retrack. I came here nine times in, between two thousand five two thousand six to research why. No one opened, has opened up a full-time comedy club in Asia. But there was comedy before we came along. We just okay. took it to a whole new level. I see. So I was in retail for many, many years. So it's amazing just to see people laugh. Now I realize why no one has ever done this before. We, from a business standpoint, <laughs> it's, hard. You, you know, it's, it's super hard. Because <laughs> not only am I a comedian, I run the club, and I teach them comedy. Also, we started teaching for the first time in my life, fall of 06, before we opened February of 07. But okay. today, typically, I know we have shows Friday and Saturday, so reservations. I'm always online. Mm-hmm. Uh, your, your phone's the phone was ringing right since, now. Yeah. And I know it's, it's a ticket reservation, so uh-huh. um, uh, so I have to call that media. Or it's, it's, I mean, I'm running a business. I lose ticket sales, right? right. Uh, so what's, people WhatsApp me, uh, Facebook message me, call me, text me, any which way you can just to uh-huh. for, for ticketing. So this is a one-man operation. We basically have minimal budget here. We don't have a bar. It's BYOD, okay. BYOB, whatever. Uh, bring your own drinks. Bring, bring your own drugs. Bruce, is that uh, BYOD? You know, but it's, it's, I wish <laughs> I wish you would see a, uh, a show here because we don't have a bar, no restaurant. This is a kill room. This is one of the. I mean, I, I we brought over so many comedians, uh-huh. and then we just closed a deal uh, yesterday. We're gonna bring over Pablo Francisco. Oh, fun! Uh, in September, uh, yeah. so we got big theater in September, and then he's gonna. Come here uh, for one show, and then I mean, you know who he is. He's gonna kill the room over here. Yeah, this is so, well. This is this this room has like the trappings of a. It's intimate. It's tight. The yep, ceiling's yep, low. Yep, 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 yep. You this, know, it's well we, engineered to to we, create laughs. We set the conditions for you to succeed. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, my typical day Saturday, I know six o'clock is a, right now six to nine o'clock. Hong Kong is a different market, but Hong Kong people is a going out city. So right now, between six and nine. Through my experience, people are gonna be like, "Hey, what are you doing that? What are you doing that? What are you doing that? Hey, let's go see the comic club. You want one? You want one?" So I'll be start getting a lot of messages uh, pretty soon for a last minute decisions to come see our show. Okay. And what so, do you see in here? We see 150 maximum, which okay. we sold out last Saturday. Today we already have like 70, 80 reservations, uh, which is great. Yeah. So that's that, that's my typical day. I I hope people will be booking tickets. That, <laughs> <laughs> but today also you have a son, so I'm I'm fortunate and blessed to have a job where I don't have to be at the office. I mean. The internet changed the world. I mean, the, right. the smartphones, you could do so many things on it. So I'm with my son playing swimming and, and football today, and I got my smartphone with me. So I'm doing business while I'm taking care of my son. Yeah, that's great. I um, So, yeah, how do you get comedians? I mean, I saw on the wall, I saw my buddy Alonzo Bowden on the wall. Was He's been here. Yeah. yeah, so how, how do you... 
how do you get folks coming over to, to, to Asia? How do you get them to Hong Kong? Word of mouth, basically. Yeah. Well, again, I've been doing comedy for a long time. So I already built uh, connections or relationships before I became here. Tom okay. Carter, America's Got Talent Runner Up. He was here two weeks ago, right? Okay. I met him 15 years ago in New York City. Never heard of him before. So I'm at a, new, I got a comedy club. Walked off stage. I was laughing so hard. Introduced myself. But he had no idea my plans, my intentions to come out here when I was still thinking about it 15 years ago. And then uh, his last two weeks ago was his uh, sixth time I brought him out here. Okay. Then, so... Through all these comedians I met years ago, then word of mouth started coming. People want to come out here. So a lot of comedians have never been out here before, and right. they don't deal for the money. They come in for the experience. Yeah, it's priceless. How many people have performed in Hong Kong before? How many people now, the last 11 years, like, like I said, there was comedy before we came along, uh-huh. sporadically at restaurants. Sure. But we took it to a whole new level. Now, I recently did a survey on Facebook. 11 years, we've hit about now over a hundred cities in Asia that okay. have comedy or have had comedy okay. since we started 11 years ago. Yeah. Like whether it's Jakarta, Tokyo, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, KL, Shanghai, Beijing, right? There's also smaller cities. So now so many comedians now coming over and, it, and instead of 11 years ago, one week in Hong Kong, now they do three, four weeks touring all over Asia. Right. We've hit an untapped market. we created a comedy market and untapped material. Yeah. And who, and what's your average? Uh, do you have an average um, audience member? Are these? Oh, uh, you know what? Locals, it's it's still it's still amazing. When we had we had 150 people last yeah, week, Virginia right. yesterday. So, so what, people what was the breakdown? only people only mix some uh-huh. Americans, some Australians, some French, some Italians, some Russians, some Germans, some Chinese Chinese people, some local Singaporeans. It's, it's the most diverse comedy audience anywhere. Okay. And the uh, reason we get people who only come see the professionals. Okay. Like we have shows every week. And once or twice a month, we bring over a big act. But then we have shows every week now. Okay. Uh, but it's amazing that we still get people who come to our club who don't even know who Jerry Seinfeld is. Okay. So that's why when I was negotiating with Pablo Francisco's people, you know, I have to let them, this is not America. This is a whole new animal. If people come to our club who don't even know who Jerry Seinfeld is, is do you really think <laughs> they're going to know who Pablo Francisco is? <laughs> right. No. But because of our reputation through the years and our newsletter and our word of mouth, they come, uh-huh. right? Because of the credits. Not saying that people... Uh, funny, but we can have someone who's actually funnier than Papa Francisco, but because they don't have no credits and their local they're not famous, no one will come. I see. And how? What's different about running a comedy club in Hong Kong than running one in the U.S.? This is still new. Yeah, we get people who come to our club who still never even heard of a club. They word of mouth. Okay. We've been here eleven years. Let me tell you a funny uh-huh. example. I've got at least. Eight, nine phone calls in 11 years, almost once a year. Hello, take out comedy. Oh, yes, you have stand-up comedy tonight? Yes. Will there be chairs? I don't want to stand around for two hours. <laughs> and they're serious. You know, we laugh because we know. <laughs> right. But to them, they don't know ideas. Yeah, so, right. so we're educating people, yeah. right? We're taking steps back to move forward. Right. The first two years, we were not called take out comedy club. Okay. We were called take out comedy shop. Why? Because I would get phone calls. Hi. Uh, yeah, how much is membership? Oh, uh, right. They think club is a whole new, it's right. a, a, a private club. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. why these are stuff that I learned through the year. That's why over here, you know, we all laugh, but these are small details as a business owner I have to adjust to. Yeah. Now through the years, we used to do improv, we used to do Chinese stand-up, we used to do storytelling. Okay. Now it's those three, three disciplines. They still uh, do shows to people at other venues, but right now through the years, English stamp comedy pays the rent, yeah. and you know we lucky. We're lucky we survived eleven years in this in this area, basically doing shows only twice a week. Yeah, right. That's wow. why every show we still thank everyone that walks in. Uh, so over here, in answer to your question, it's this is it, eleven years already. People still don't know who we are. Yeah, you're hustling. more than eleven years ago. Yeah. But every show to this day, we still ask. Before the show begins, hey, raise your hand. Don't be shy. This is your first time watching live stand-up comedy. Okay. There's always people who raise their hand who've yeah, never wow. even seen live stand-up comedy. Because also we find out that people think watching on TV is the same as live. Yeah, it's so different. It's so different. So, it's I'm, so different. So for me as a business owner, we're still trying to convince people to, to come through the doors. So like I said, we had 150 people last week sold out for Gina Yeshire. Right? Yesterday we had 40. Today we had 80. Uh-huh. People think we sell out every week. No. It's... Today, we have local talent, right? Very, very funny. But because no one's famous, right. no one's going to 
we, we won't sell out. I see. So why takeout? Why is it called takeout? You know what? I had a meeting with my friends. You read my history. Actually, Takeout Comedy started initially to help revitalize New York City's Chinatown after 9-11. Mm-hmm. So 15 years ago, next week was our first show to help our Chinatown, okay. right? We had a meeting before when I was coming back from Hong Kong with my friends to help bring back Chinatown. And one of my good friends, we had to think of a name. And he, he the moment he said, take out comedy, mm-hmm. my eyes start, shot up. I said, that's it. Okay. So my friend thought of the name, registered it, looked it up, made sure no one was taking it. Sure. Got takeoutcomedy.com. And uh, it's a great name. Yeah, it's great. So, uh, Jamie, what are you best at? You know what? I tell you, years ago, I longed to get on HBO, The Tonight Show, David Letterman. I don't, I don't anymore. Okay. I'm a comedian who happens to run a comedy club. I still perform. I'm hosting tonight. I still like do my best every night. Mm-hmm. But now I wish our comedians get on those shows. Okay. Now I'm a. I hope to not springboard people's careers, which we have now. It's wonderful. 11 years to see our communities now who were sitting, meeting them, took them to my class, see them develop. Now they're doing a full time, getting paid, doing corporate gigs, uh, getting famous now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's wonderful to see them more success- successful than I had hoped I would be. I see. And that's my goal now to, to help so you're spring both people's careers. Accelerator, accelerator uh, mentor, whatever yeah. you say it. Like now, it's a, again, it's amazing. To see this comedy grow all over Asia. Mm-hmm. Do you, so you still perform? Yes. Um, do you have a favorite opener? Do you got something that you that you go to? In the beginning, I would say I'm from New York City. Uh, make some noise. You've been in New York City, yeah. Uh, for those of you who've uh, never been, I would say make some noise. You love Hong Kong. Uh, raise your hand. This is your first time in Hong Kong. Okay. And uh, I would ask someone, first time in Hong Kong. Hope you. Didn't do what my cousin did last week from New York City. First time ever in New York, in Hong Kong visiting. Then she turns to me and asks me if I could take her to Chinatown. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. So, I haven't said that in so long. I almost forgot it. Uh, so, you know, I get a quick laugh uh, yeah, sure, uh, almost instantly. And then, you know, we're in. Uh, and then, then you know, now you can talk about Chinatown, which you're... Talk a lot. Now, close. you know, now I don't do that anymore. Now I, I do other stuff. Now do the years evolving. As a comedian, you know, what I teach is the first 30 seconds is when they decide whether they like you or not. Yes, right. So you want to get laugh ASAP and the clock is ticking. So uh, I admit myself, you know, through all these years and so many stage time, I've become a better comedian. Okay. You know, I've become a way better comedian now. It's amazing to, to not only see how comedians progress, I progress. And I'm proud to say that because, you know, every comedian's dream is to progress. Yeah. As long as you progress, you, you don't be Jerry Seinfeld. You're not going to be Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld in a year. You're not going to be Chris Rock in a year. As long as you progress, that's all that matters. So, so how have you gotten better? Quicker, uh, mm-hmm. uh, just learning, just stage time, stage time, stage time, stage time. Because the f- first 600 shows I was on, okay, because we didn't have a uh, good enough comedian, so I hosted the first 600 shows, and now I'm proud and glad to to say that you know our comedians can do 30 minutes out, 45 minutes out, and I. I let them host now. Right? Okay. You know, I want to perform once a week just to stay sharp. Okay. But now I don't have to be on every show anymore. Right. So, but for me, yeah, I guess I guess you know, just stage time, stage time, stage time. Now we do shows in other cities. Now I, I people fly me to other cities to teach. I'm basically the only one that teaches in Asia. Okay. Right? Like 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 to to my standard, right? Not yeah. other other people work, 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 work workshops and everything, but you know, I perform in Myanmar. Uh-huh. Oh, really? Yeah, recently. You know, how many people you know have performed in Burma, Myanmar? Not, so now well, you're the first, I think. Yeah, so now this, uh, this is, again, uh-huh. telling you how much this untapped market here in Asia. Yeah, I mean, certainly this is a golden age of comedy. Yeah. Another, yet another one. So you're a teacher. Yeah. I'm a teacher. But our worlds are really quite different. You know, so teaching... So, I, so when I was working on the Humor Code, I went... I actually sat in on a stand-up comedy class. Uh, mm, Greg, yeah. Greg O'Dean, I think is his name. Okay. Greg Dean? Greg O'Dean? And it was really fascinating um, to see the stuff that he was working on. Some of it was incredibly mundane. You know, things like how to hold a mic, how yep. to take the mic out of the stand, and, you know, l- like stuff that you wouldn't think needed to be taught, but Well, you'd do. be surprised. Yeah. yeah. To, uh, I remember him working th- on crowd work. So, you know, like lessons on how do you do crowd work, you know, and how do you keep that moving and working and practicing that, that kind of thing. I teach crowd work too, but uh, advanced crowd work uh, for 
people for our comedians who have done it a while. Okay. Because I mean, for me, so I don't advanced, want to, I, advanced crowd work. Well, so I, I, let me take that back. I, I, let me tell you, I, I teach crowd for advanced comedians. Oh, I so, see. So, 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 <laughs> I, so like I don't want to bombard <laughs> I, a person who has never done this before. I mean, if you tell them a zillion things, I mean, this is already so hard to do. Like that's why I believe in in, in just progression. Okay. And you know, we teach the basics first, and that once you get it while we see that you're good at it, then later on we offer a crowd work workshop. But you got to walk before you run. For, yeah, that's why. Right. That's why I don't want to overwhelm someone. I mean, so what's the secret to crowd work? Reading the room. Okay. I mean, the show starts. Crowd work starts before you even get on the stage. Okay. And you see the comedians before you, who they're yeah. talking to. Yummy. Yeah, I mean, Everything that happens before you is intelligence. I mean, you gotta watch the room, read the room. We call it feeling the temperature out uh-huh. before you even go on. See who wants to talk to you, who doesn't want to talk to you, who's a good person to talk to. Everything you have to notice everything mm-hmm. before you even go on the stage. That's why I tell people. I've seen myself. You can do comedy. Your public speaking skills go way up. Creativity, communication skills, just observations, mm-hmm. everything. That's why you are super multitasking up there in five minutes. But the key also is the show starts before you even go on the stage. Yeah. You know, I've had, so. I had a conversation with a, a Denver comedian, Janae Burris, and she was telling me that she, she scouts the audience. She'll you go have out to. And, and watch the audience and listen and so on. And it kind of it reminds me a little bit of, of I, I used to play lacrosse. By the way, psychology. Mm-hmm. It, it, what, what you uh, teach, right? It's, it's all psychology. Also, the, the, you have to read the psyche of the crowd or, or individually. You know, they're reading you; you're reading them. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I, I just remember think. You know, I remember even when I would just play like weekend warrior stuff. I would walk the field mm. before a game. You know, just to figure out the lay of what the field is like and what the grass is like and are you know are there holes in certain places you know because these are you know these are municipal fields and then watching the other team warm up and stuff like that just to try to get any little oh all these edge. things yeah the, yeah the day of the week tells you something where they sit tells you something uh-huh. what time they come in tells you something who the whip tells you something i mean quickly i teach people the room is empty doors open at 8:45. five people walk in the sit in the second row they choose to sit in the second row, not anywhere else, but in the second row. What does that tell you as a comedian, right? You're in the back watching this. So what does that tell you? That tells you really two things. One, uh, they've been here before at a comedy show. Uh, second row is... Uh, it's <laughs> like, fun, uh, but it's all good. Yeah, but second row, I mean, they're okay if we talk to them, yeah, right? So they're okay. Or two, they have no idea. Okay. That's basically it. it all right. <laughs> but you, 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 you watch it. Because over here, too, again, you get a lot of people who have never been here before. They think, second seat, all right, let me get my money's worth, value, I'm going to sit in the second row. Uh-huh. But they have no idea that we might talk to them. Yes. Yeah, right? right? So that's why over here, I mean, it's, it's wonderful. That's why, I mean, we're booked until with international meetings until next spring. So many people have contacted me that want to hit our club because, you know, word of mouth is strong. Right. Just word of mouth through the, through the uh, uh, professional level. I'm a comedian myself, so I know how to treat comedians. Uh, you know, a lot of comedians just been screwed before, mm-hmm. so I make sure they get paid on time. I say what I do and do what I say. Uh-huh. Yeah, I see you have a do. You, you've got the official hotel for takeout comedy. Yeah, we have is a hotel. Yeah, that's where they. Stay. That's where they stay. We have yeah. a hotel sponsor, but you know, this is a bare minimum comedy club. We don't have a bar. We spend everything on 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 the system, uh, and just wonderful again, just to see people laugh. Yeah. So, so you're 11 years in, Let me five years it. from now, 10 years from now? Hopefully still be doing this uh, okay. place. And, you know, my, my priorities have changed also, you know, before when I was single, not married, you know, I, I wanted really hard to have shows every night, right? Okay. But, you know, I got married seven years ago, uh, six years ago now. Uh, my son is six, going to turn seven this year. So now, now I'm, I'm, I guess things happen for a reason where I don't have shows every night now. We just have open mics then really Friday and Saturday. Okay. You know, the, the random shows on Thursday. We have a Valentine's Day show on Wednesday this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm <laughs> glad to spend my nights now with my son. What kind so, of couples come to uh, a Valentine's Day show? Oh, it's Day great. Show. It's yeah. great. Valentine's Day shows, we always look forward to to it because, uh, you know, we charge uh, one price for single and cheaper price for couples. Okay. We get people who come all the time. I mean, it's great. It's a great Valentine's Day show. Uh, it doesn't idea. matter what day of the week it is. It can be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We always have it and always get a big crowd because it's, it's going out. It's a it's day, going yeah, out. It's, it's a, a fun, day out. fun thing to do. That's yeah. great. So, so what are you working on these days? Like, what's 
you know. Well, we just closed a deal to bring Pablo Francisco here. Yeah. I mean, he's a huge comedian, yeah. uh, and it's uh, it's great that we're gonna be bring him to another venue, a bigger venue in September, and this club. I mean, he's gonna kill this room. And then uh, I'm still working details on our twelfth annual Hong Kong International Comedy Festival in the in the fall. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, it's great. I mean, if you see our, our website, um, takeoutcomedy.com, it's, it's great that now we have this year, the first five months, we have so many comedians, not only flying over, but also regional comedians coming to do the one-man shows in, in our club. Okay. So another thing that's happened years ago, we were dependent on international comedians who were coming over here, mm-hmm. while the local comedians, regional, were working on the craft. Okay. Now they've gotten so much better here. Netflix is here now. Netflix has like, given some of these comedians in Asia their own special now. Oh, so now right? through the years, we've become less dependent on international comedians because Asia comedians, comedians in Asia, mm-hmm. have become stronger now. So it's amazing to see leveling out the playing fields. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's, it's amazing just to see all this develop before our eyes. So do you think that there's an Asian style to stand up? Is there, a, is there a difference? Just six six plus last minute. That's it. That's that's the gauge. That's the gauge. You know what? Every show is different. Every crowd is different. Again, just like the States, what is funny in North Dakota is not necessarily funny in Tallahassee, Florida. Sure. You have to localize your bits. And, you know, that's why we have people coming in here, American comedians. We, 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 we prep them all. You can't be two Americans. Okay. You can't have too many American references. Remember, most people in the crowd have, are not American and have never been to America. Right. So you can't have too many references to Costco. Right. right? You can't have too many. That's why you know, we have a prep, we, have, we prepare them and everything. That's why our communities now, we prepare them to go to the States now. So now international communities are coming over here. And now Hong Kong communities and, and communities from Asia are not going over here now. Right. It's amazing. The key word, what I look for when I bring somebody over and my development of our communities is be worldly. Okay. Okay, that's it. Find out what's going on in CNN. Be general. Be worldly. Never going to make everybody laugh. And not everyone's going to always get all your stuff. Your goal is to make most of the people laugh. Mm-hmm. And a great comedian can make a crowd laugh anywhere, anytime, any place. Because mm-hmm. he or she makes the right adaptations. Yeah, you know, I asked the question about, you know, like about these local comedians. Yep. Because, you know, like one of the real ben- I think one of the nice things about comedy, good comedy, is that it, it notices things that the audience doesn't notice. Yes, yes. And it, and then it points it out, and the, and the audience agrees with it, right? So yep. it's not just that the audience. And so, so I ask that question in part because, you know, are these comedians noticing things? You know, different things, right? You know, they have a different culture and a different orientation and a different set of rules that you know that they were raised yep. raised with. And so, yeah, they have that call it gene, call it, um, they've learned uh, the strategy, the tactics of being yep. a comedian. But, but are, they, you know, are they making fundamentally different kinds of observations because they're just approaching the world in a different way? That's progression. Because as a rookie comedian, you have your bits. Mm-hmm. You know, self-deprecating. You make fun of yourself being a, a, a Chinese, being French, being an American. But after a while, you got to talk about current events also. I mean, for example... You know, I have bits, but I'm always on scene and know what's going on in the world. You have to. Yeah. For example, North Korea is going to be in the Olympics. Okay. Right? And I agree with you. You, you kind of need to know what's going on, right? And kind of edu- now educating the audience, but in a funny way. So, for, for example, a couple of weeks ago when it was breaking news that North Korea was going to be in the Winter Olympics, right? Okay. It was great. So, I had a new bit that night. And I said, like, uh, yeah, the great news is that North Korea... It's going to be in, this, in the Winter Olympics, and South Korea has accepted their 500 athletes, okay. right? The bad news is that they're all athletes, right, in the biathlon. Okay. <laughs> See, you laugh, and I'm, I thought that was pretty clever, and the biathlon is a shooting. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's only shooting it's, yeah, sport. So, right. But here, most people don't, know, don't what know what biathlon, biathlon is, is, so I don't yeah, do that anymore. Right. I tried it three times, rule of three, right? So I also <laughs> say uh, they're a bit greedy, North Korea, and now they're uh, trying to get into the 2020 Summer Olympics in Tokyo, okay. right? Where they will bring their best 100-meter one-way sprinters. I see, right, yes, right. And that, then people get that one. More than the other one, yes, you know, I'm right, talking about right. defectors. If you, if you did not get that, I'm talking about defectors, right? <laughs> My point is... You know, I, I do a lot of local jokes, and uh-huh. tonight I'm posting. I got some local references also because these are great. Because they won't work five months from now. Okay. Yeah. 
Right. But of course, everyone has their bits that they work all the time with well, your kids and that. But that's why that's something I want to I, I, I push. And it's not easy to make a stuff on the spot. Yeah. So that's something I push to my advanced communities. Okay, now we know your stuff. You know your stuff. Now try to localize. I mean, more presentize your bits and also use current events more. Yes, that's right. So, yeah, and it's special for the audience, right? Because it's now they know you're not just doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they, and it also makes you fresh. And also they know that. You're gonna be doing new stuff. I'm gonna see you again because you know our audience is smart. They're gonna they look on our, our website who's performing, who's not performing. Oh, mm-hmm. this guy does all new stuff. You know, I want to come back. Yeah, that's but right. If they say, oh, this guy's gonna, he's, he's been saying the same thing ten times in a row. I'm not gonna go back. Yeah, you know, it's I, a business for me. That's why I, I repeat customers are good customers. Indeed. Yeah. I you know yeah I teach customer lifetime value. You need people coming coming back and back. So you know the only, yeah, the only I, person doesn't want repeat customer is. Um, uh, Vera Wang just opened up a wedding gown uh, store on Salton Street, uh, right. and I say uh, her, her business is so well she's getting repeat customers. Oh uh, right, yeah. <laughs> didn't, didn't really, doesn't that's only anyway. It doesn't. <laughs> so when, when you when you make when you make your biathlon joke, yeah. and it doesn't get laughs, yeah. do you have a do you have a response? I mean, you know that's fine, right? You know it's okay yeah. that you didn't get a laugh to that because yeah. it's invaluable information. Do you have a way that, to manage that, though, yep. with the audience when you're on stage? They call saves, right? So yes. I have a save ready in my hand. Uh, and if that doesn't work, uh, I'll be like, uh, okay, folks, now we know the level of audience. Okay, uh, knock, knock. So <laughs> I I'll really tone it down and get a laugh and I move on. So, okay. you know. So you, and, uh, you know, I've never heard that. They're called saves. Saves. Yeah. Saves. So yeah. what are the, what's the, what's the traditional save? A traditional save could be like uh, a friend of mine, uh, if something doesn't work, uh, he's like, hey, come on, guys. I laughed when you walked in. I see. Okay. So my community says that another another traditional save. This one is as a hack one. Everyone, say, if someone, if someone, if no one laughs at your bit, yeah. right? You, you just knock on the yeah, mic. Hey, it, is this thing working? That's right. And those, these are saves. That is really. Hacking. That's why as a comedian, that's really hacking. But yeah. my point as a comedian, remember, nothing is guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Nothing is guaranteed. Your A material works only nine percent of the time. A great comedian is always ready and flexible. To whatever happens, yeah. it's a live show. Those are the great comedians and the experienced ones. You you could see an experienced one and a non-experienced one. So, um, so you've been doing this for a while. This is a calling for you. Yeah. There's Wild nothing time. else you want to do. Yep. Do you have moments of self-doubt? Do you have moments of what's going to happen? Do you, do you? You know, it's a. It's different for me because you know I run a business. I mean, I have rent to pay, uh, so it's, it's a different mentality. Like, I have to find that balance between making business decisions and personal decisions. Okay. All right. Tell me because more. sometimes our comedian again, this this goes back to what I said earlier. If a comedian repeats the same material all the time, all the time, and no one comes because of this, right? Right. right? I'm not gonna book him or her as often. That's why I continually teach to get fresh blood. Right. Right. And also. Years ago, our standards are so high now to, for someone, for me to let in our rotation. Okay. Years ago, I would let anybody in because it was it. Yeah. But now our prices, we've increased our prices. Now we have such high standards now, mm-hmm. right? Our shows are great now. The product is great now mm-hmm. compared to years ago in the beginning. I still get people who come to our shows years ago. I, I would admit most of our shows in the beginning, right? Were mediocre, mm-hmm. right? And some were horrible because we have people who are practicing stand-up comedy. Right. Right. They're learning while they're they're performing. Yeah, that's yeah. why this is so hard for us to do because you could be a heart surgeon. You want to be a heart surgeon, you could perform on a cadaver, on a model of a heart. Doing to be a successful comedian, you have to perform in front of live audience all the time. You yeah. cannot perform in front of your friends or your family. Is it wrong gauge? They'll laugh at everything that comes out of your mouth. Yes. But you have to practice in front of a live audience. That's why this is so hard now. Uh-huh. So that's why it's wonderful now. So I have high standards now. Okay. Is what I'm saying. So yeah, you're you're charging like thirty dollars US for a ticket. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's yeah, that's uh, that's but not the, trivial. But, but the good news is that you bring your own drinks. A, uh-huh. a two dollar. <laughs> so people don't know that. But well, there's other shows around town where they have to break. You have to go to a bar and pay eight, seven US dollars for a drink. So people right. don't know that. Oh, but here's a better value. Uh, it's BYOB. Yeah. So it's great. You know. So you don't, so I wish by the way I wish it wasn't BYOB because as you know bar comic clubs make money off the drinks yeah, and it's, it also but it wasn't meant to be just it's not worth it it's not worth it having of shows only twice a week so you didn't exactly answer my question though do you have self doubts or you're oh, you're confident I can't this is I you know, mean do you question do you you or do you lose I don't think I don't, I don't think too much about okay you can't change the past you're going to change the future okay. so I 
with the, the mistakes or not I make in the, in the past, I learn from it, right? But I can't dwell on the past, right? Again, I, I don't know whether this club will survive or not, but either way, I know I will be doing comedy until the day I die. Okay. Because, you know, you hear the saying, this is a drug, right? This is not your drug. You, you, you want that high you, uh, uh, of making people laugh, right? It's a, if, for people who've never done stand up comedy before, if you do a great show and you walk off, it's a buzz that yeah, lasts yeah, hours. Oh, yeah. I mean, you hear especially people think yeah, this is better than sex. Well, you know what? It is. People who've never had a great show in a great room, you know, we can't tell you what goes in our mind. And I teach people this also. I tell you, the day, the first time, you go up there and you just destroy a room and I'm uh -huh. watching you and you have an out-of-body experience. Uh -huh. You just can't believe. And what I mean by out-of-body experience is when you go up there, you could be seeing the same thing for like months, years. And somehow the crowd was with you. Whatever you say, somehow you made a decision to go this way, right? You're talking, you're enunciating, everything's coming out. They're laughing at everything, right? Uh -huh. But you're thinking, I can't believe this shit is happening, <laughs> right? We, right. You, I see that. You see that. And you walk over, you go, what the fuck just happened, right? Right. That's an out of experience. I've seen it happen to our comedians and you walk off and you're like, you want to do it again yeah, and yeah. again and again and again. It's just amazing. That's great. So to change gears here a little bit. What are you listening to? What are you reading? What are you watching these days that really stands out to you that you just think is just great? I recommend it to everyone. Okay. And this book has helped me tremendously. Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence oh, really? Others. Yeah. I read that every year since 1991. Okay. Every year. Everything they get, they tell you in there, I've done on stage in my life and everything, and it has helped me tremendously. That's my Bible. So, so do you like at a certain time of the year you you read it? Every now and then, whatever I'm usually to be honest with you, it's, it's in my backpack when I travel. Okay. So when when I travel somewhere, I, that's my airplane kind of book. Yeah. Uh, so I read it. it just reminder, you know, refresh my mind so, to smile, you know, to, to, to yeah. So to, wait, yeah, what are some of the what are some of the lessons? What are the things to know people's names, okay. right? Smile, uh, yes, right? Like, like don't don't start an argument. Avoid arguments if you can, uh -huh. right? Uh, show the other person. Give them a higher pedestal. Ah, uh, yes. Right? Yeah. Just like the crowd. Make, make, make sure you're humble. Humility we preach also. No arrogant. Don't be, don't be an asshole. Don't be, don't, don't think you're better than the audience, right? Let them think you're higher than you, right? They'll appreciate it. They, they see it. They see it. So, yeah. that's why I love that book. Uh, I also read a lot of Steve Martin's uh, book. Uh, Born, uh, Standing, Born Standing Up. Up. I love that. It's I quote nice him book. when he yeah. says, uh, uh, you know, comedy is always something happening. I'm comedy is about something that's happening and there's always something happening. Yeah, so I think I said that earlier, okay, but, but, you know, that's what he says. You know, that board standing up book is a really nice book. It's one of the few books that you read that leaves you wanting more. You know, mm. you, you know, you only get a taste of his life yeah. in that book. This is a tremendously successful, not just comedian, but person in terms of, you know, moving from being the biggest stand-up on earth to moving into television and film. Now he's, like, on Broadway, oh, playing yeah, the yeah. banjo and so on. You know, this is a really, really fascinating guy. And you know, the book's a little slight, and in that way, you know, you get an idea of how he got started, but you yeah. kind of go, like, well, what were your 40s and your 50s, you know, 60s like? Yeah, that's, it's quite nice. It's you might come nice. out with part two. So <laughs> I'm actually in a book. Uh, someone called me up years ago. I'm in a book. I believe it's, uh, it's called Funny Business. I believe you, you can look me up. Okay. Uh, they mentioned about the club when they talked about. I think I have that funny, book on my uh, bookshelf. What's her name? I forgot the name. Shirley or since I wrote that. She interviewed me. So, so that's I'm fine. I'm pretty sure it's called, it's a hardcover, not thin book, but it's not thick also. Yeah. So, uh, oh, great. You know, it's, for me, so you you look to you read more than you listen to podcasts or I don't watch listen, TV yeah, or movies. Yeah, I listen to this one. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, you know, I, I, now I spend a lot of time with my son, but I'm I'm from the '80s, and the music I listen to is all from the '80s. Okay. I don't think music now, no disrespect, is 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 to my liking. Okay, um, I still listen to what are you uh, listening to? You two, Air Supply. I uh, went to the, Elton John. You know, that's just the, the '80s. Oh, fun! I went to I saw you two's. Um, Joshua Tree reunion tour. Oh no way! It was really fun to do. Yeah, I saw him. Yeah, I saw him in the Joshua Tree because I worked at Syracuse University, the Cary Dome, uh, venue yes. merchandising. So you know, when they came in, it was great. Billy Joe, just just see, seeing all these people. So I mean, it's great. So, That's great. So um, I always finish with this question, and it's uh, what is the secret to success that everybody knows, but people have trouble doing? 
Everybody knows the secret to success, but they just can't seem to do it. Off the top of my head, I'm going to have to say relationships. Okay. Business-wise, because you know what? It, to be successful, it's h- hard to do it by yourself. Mm-hmm. You need a team. Okay. You need people that will help you, uh, whether you want it or not. You know, you, you, you sometimes you have to let go and designate duties, whatever. Uh-huh. So who's on your team? You know, I treat my comedians with respect because I'm, I'm also a comedian. Mm-hmm. So I know the other side and they all are very appreciative. Most of them appreciative mm-hmm. of what we're doing here at this club. I really say I, I say we. Mm-hmm. Honestly, as a comedy producer, comedy booker, it's a thankless job. Yeah, it's, running, it's a thankless job. Mm-hmm. Uh, but years from now, and I tell people, like, I do it for myself. I do every show as if it is my last, right? Because sooner or later, this is going to end, uh-huh. right? And you don't know what you have until it's gone. That's why a lot of comedians, I, they tell me this. If it wasn't for our club, they wouldn't be here, okay. right? So they, And I tell them, they, just tell your friends to come see, see our shows. You know, relationships, word of mouth, smiling, and treat people with, with respect. We see everything in that book, Dale Carnegie. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> this, so this this is connected to something that you were sort of talking about earlier about this idea of... By the way, let me just elaborate on that. Please. I read this earlier, like a CEO might not know everything, uh-huh. right? A, com- a, a CEO of a chemical company might not know everything on the periodic table, okay. but he knows how to treat people who do, and if they're successful, you're successful. Yeah, so, you know, yeah I think, you know, we were saying this earlier about these co- comics, you know, about like holding thinking of like elevating the audience yep, yep. you know and so this is an idea that i i'm really fascinated by in improv right so mm. everybody when people talk about the rules of improv they always talk about yes and yes but to me i think the, the really fascinating rule of improv is this notion of we're all supporting actors right my role is not to shine on stage yep. my role is to help everybody else to shine on stage teamwork yeah, and this notion, I, I, I like this word, gifting, mm, um, yes, as, yes. A, as a way to, to, to really like make that a tangible kind of idea. And I, you know, and I think that you know, you're right, like this, the, the interesting thing about comedy often is, you know, the people get into comedy, they're not always, they don't always fit in, you know what I mean? They're, they're clearly not normal. It, it's, hard, it's hard to be a good comic and to be completely normal. Yeah. You know, you have to see the world slightly askew, yep. I think. Yep. Yep. You know? yep. Yet, to be successful as a comic, as you know, it does help to be a professional. You know, and I think that that's something that, um, that co- a lot of comics struggle with because they, you know, they want to live by their own schedule and they want to, you know, they want to be edgy and they, you know, all these kinds of things. And yet, this, as you said, this is a business. You've got to show up on time. You've got to be nice to the staff. You've got to, you know what I mean? You've got to help promote. The Don't stuff. be a dick. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. And I, I've heard. Um, so uh, I talked to Chris Mazzelli, who runs Goth. I know him. Yeah. yeah. And Chris says exactly that same thing. He says, "Don't be an asshole." He's like, "I pay attention. How do you treat the staff? Do you show up on time?" And he says, "I don't care how funny you are. If you don't take, if you don't do those things, I'm not going to book you because you know this because of the business." I get emails also. I I do my due diligence on, on comedians. I mean, they could be funny, but I know if, if I know they have a bad reputation or uh-huh. assholes, I won't bring them over here. Yeah, that's right. So, because you know what, coming over here, here too, getting a work visa, you're representing yourself. You can't get in trouble. Take out comedy. This is a whole. This is not an ordinary road trip, right? And briefly, <laughs> teamwork. You know, st- improv is definitely a team sport, but comedy also because, especially hosting, a great host. Makes him or herself look good, but make everybody else better. Yes. Like, for example, a host can find a good intelligence. Yesterday we had a show. This girl, the host asked her name, and I'm not making this up. She said uh, her name is uh, uh, Seaman. Okay. Right? She was not lying. She's Chinese. Her Chinese name is. She kind of like gave it up. We knew that she wasn't lying, and we were joking. People laughed. Then he made a a quick remark I hope your surname is not Butthole. Okay. All right? It was funny. But he, I mean, he could go on and on and on. And that's why he was a great host to. To experience, he left that that and gave it to the other comedians. Now, I see, right? So he wasn't a dick and ate that for another five minutes. Take it, okay. Hope hope they heard it and we roll with we, we callbacks throughout the night and everything, right? Right. 
So individual sport, but also team sport stamp comedy. Yeah, no so, doubt. Uh, Jamie, so I know you're busy, and I know you've got a show in a few hours, so I'm going to let you go, but I just want to say thanks so much for doing this. No, thank this you. A lot of fun. Thank you. Love Denver. Uh, been there before. Uh, just the airport. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's great that to see comedy grow around the world. Yeah, this is great. I'm so happy to be able to do this. One day North Korea, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit PeterMcGraw.org for more information about our guests, show notes, and social media links. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share with others. Join Dr. Peter McGraw next week for another fun, fascinating conversation on I'm Not Joking. Yo.